Welcome to the Business Samurai Podcast. I'm your host, John Barker. With me is my good friend, Justin Holroyd. Justin served 14 years in the United States Marine Corps before an unknown medical condition prompted an unexpected early retirement that required Justin to get a pacemaker. Justin was in the Fleet Marine Band, which is the Musician Enlisted Option Program, MIOP, as if, if you don't realize it, Marines love their acronyms. Justin played the trombone. He oversaw 500 military members during his active duty time, where he played in 20 different, 21 different countries with kings and queens and presidents, managing multi-million dollar productions. He recently graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration, Communications, and Project Management. He's currently pursuing his master's degree in similar studies. Justin, for as many people, including my own family members, father, grandfather, uh, aunts, uncles that have been in the Marines, Justin is the first one that I know that has had uh, a background in music. So I thought that would be an interesting take for or for people looking for uh, a, a different side of the uh, the military. So Justin, appreciate taking the time to be here. Happy to be here, man. Thanks for having me. And and just for anyone listening, I actually got this messed up. Uh, this was actually my second intro because I didn't realize there was like two different sides of the the Marine Corps. You got the Marine Corps band, and then you have this MEOP enlisted program. And so we had to go do some changes here on on the fly. So thanks for getting corrected. And again, having been around the Marines for. 40 some odd years and work with many. I, I didn't realize there was actually two different programs and, you know, we'll get into that here in a little bit, but so give us a little background. I mean, have you always, did you always play instruments and know you were going to go into the Marine Corps doing that? Can you give us a little backstory on, on your entry into music? Cause that's to me, like I said, that's not common for what I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I had been around music my whole life. Both my parents were music teachers. My dad taught high school band for almost 30 years and was and still is involved in music education now uh, um, as an administrator at level now. Um, but he, so music was already, always a part of my life. I, I knew I was going to be in the band in high school. I knew I was going to play an instrument. And so I, I started playing trombone and when I was probably nine or 10 and have been playing it ever since. I, I never thought I'd be in the Marine Corps. Um, in fact, I had already a, uh, a music scholarship for tuition, my tuition cover to go to the University of Wyoming to major in music when oh, wow. a, um, they call them musical technical assistants. They're music guys in my program on recruiter duty that help out the recruiting districts in auditioning um, people that might be interested in the band. And there was a guy that showed up at my school and I'll never forget this. He showed up at my, at my school. He was trying to get people to audition i wasn't interested and you know he kind of was like well you probably wouldn't make it anyway and so i <laughs> i uh, <laughs> completely <laughs> fell for that hook line and sinker my horn wasn't even at school that day but i drove home got it and came back so i'm a senior in high school and auditioned with the intention of just saying you know i'm gonna make it and then i wasn't gonna go but then i did make it and um and you know i after some time thinking about it, I ended up deciding to go and it was the hands down one the best decision I think I may have ever made next to Mary and Laura. Um, but I would have met, never met her without you know, joining the Marine Corps. So yes. it was So it, you knew going in you were gonna be in in the band. You yeah, were gonna it, be it doing music like going that. in. It doesn't happen like that for everybody, but I did. I auditioned and had made the audition before I even like went to MEPS or talked really seriously, talked to a recruiter or any of those things. Sometimes it doesn't work like that. Sometimes you go in and the recruiter figures out that you play an instrument and then brings that guy in to audition you. Uh, and then you kind of switch gears, switch paths. But I, I, I had made and passed the audition before I even got serious about enlisting. Now, did you have a normal boot camp experience? Was it 12, 12 weeks long? Did you have like a yeah. Camp Lejeune or, or whatever? I was in, uh, camp I was West Coast. I, I went to, to San Diego for boot camp and for MCT. And that's, you're talking about the two different sides of the, of the Marine music world. That's, that's the big one. You know, the president's own is a fantastic, phenomenal organization that is some of the world's best musicians in that group, but they do not go to boot camp. In the fleet music program or the MIOP program, everybody goes to boot camp. Everybody goes to combat training school, um, and you're respected. You know, especially back in 03 through 07, you know, 
there were Marine band guys deploying and and sitting right next to, uh, you know, I, I've got a story. My first section leader, you know, has some accolades and awards for being a machine gunner on top of a tank, you know, so uh, it's, it, it's that's sort of a difference. I didn't ever, you know, fortunately, I never had to do that. I got close a couple of times, but I didn't have to. But that's one of the big differences is that the president's own is not going to deploy in that capacity where everybody in the MEOP, um, that is something that could happen. So, okay, yeah. So l I want to just clarify that. for I think for a lot of us, and again, this is kind of the mistake I made when I did the, the first version of the intro, was thinking you've got the Marine Corps band, you know, and it's, it's referred to as the president's own. It was founded in 1798. They're the largest, the, the oldest, America's oldest uh, uh, Marine professional organizational music organization that there is in the United States. And yours is a, and I thought yours was like a, just a subset of that, but there are two distinct entities that, that people, however, they get recruited into one versus into the other. Yeah. That, that is that correct. Is accurate. Yeah. Okay. That's accurate. So how, so you're going in, you're going through normal boot camp. So you're, you know, shooting and stuff like that. How do you divide the time up between maintaining com uh, a combat readiness versus being able to go out and play events? How do, how does that time, how do, how does your days, weeks training look like with that? Yeah, that's, the, that is a huge challenge. Uh, always for the program is because there's two different things you, that you really got to hone you know music is a skill you got to spend a lot of time developing and and those right. same things on the marine corps side are similar and so that's why a lot of a lot of musicians once they get in the program you know once they get in the marine corps they ended up they end up being pretty successful because they understand the um this the thought process of you know having to spend a lot of time um developing and working and putting in on a skill so uh it it sounds like two worlds that don't mesh, but they, they it, it, to me, it's absolutely there. <laughs> there are two opposite ends of the spectrum to me. <laughs> well, and it, there is some of it. I mean, there's definitely some in the music world that would not, you know, that it doesn't mesh with. But if you, if you, you know, if you have a little bit of crazy in you, because I think anybody that joins the Marine Corps has got a little bit of crazy in them. If you got just a <laughs> little, a little bit of it in you, then you can really, it, it can be a, a, a very successful thing. And it was, it was a very successful career for me. You know, as far as like your day to day, you, you, you break that out. And there's, there's times of the year that the band would block out to focus solely on Marine Corps training, Marine Corps size of things. And there's different, there's different philosophies uh, about how to do that. There were, I was at I were at I was at bands where we would try to do a little bit of that every single day. I was at bands where we did focus more on seasons. This season we will, you know, we'll we'll focus on music hard and heavy because we have these commitments coming up. We don't have commitments coming up these next few months, so we kind of switch gears and focus on Marine Corps training stuff. But the Marine the way the enlisted Marine Corps program in general, not necessarily for just the music world, but for all of the Marine Corps, you know, you can't just focus on one thing. Even if it's if it's music, if it's motor T, if it's um, you know admin cyber stuff, whatever you're doing to get promoted and to be successful in the Marine Corps, you gotta have Marine Corps training buttons checked or boxes checked. You know, so they 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 it's not a, it's not lip service that once a Marine always a, or, or um, every Marine rifleman. You know, every that is a philosophy that you know that trickles down to every occupational field in the pro in the Marine Corps. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, cause I remember growing up seeing my dad say, you know, all of the marksmanship badges yeah. that he would have those times he would have to put that stuff on his uniform, which I don't recall that being very frequent, but there were times. Yeah. Now you mentioned, you mentioned bands plural. So how was the structure set up? I mean, is how many like divisions were there in, like, Sure. How many events did they run? You know, that type of stuff. Well, events that they ran is, is, is a ton. Um, there are 10 different Marine Corps, pro, Marine Corps fleet bands. There's uh, one in Japan, one in Hawaii, several in Southern California, um, and then a couple in the Carolinas and one in Virginia. So there's, so there's one at each division right now, um, and there's one at each well, is that right? Let me think about that. There are Okinawa, San Diego, Miramar, Pendleton, uh, Hawaii, New Orleans, Quantico, uh, the other in San Diego, 
like the depot, um, and then Cherry Point, North Carolina, and Camp Lejeune. So that there's your ten. Okay. <laughs> But then, but you would get deployed all across the world then to places. Yeah, different bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I spent a lot of my time in Hawaii, which was awesome. Um, and we got to. I went all over Asia to do different different performances. I did a, we did a tour of New Zealand a couple times, two stretches out there. Once for the Rugby World Cup, which was a lot of fun, and then we did another three week tour in New Zealand where we were commemorating the the 50th anniversary of Marines landing in New Zealand and staging there before they embarked on the island hopping campaign in World War II. So it's, it's a, it's an interesting gig for sure. You, you can't, you learn a lot about, you know, that you're immersed in Marine Corps history and Marine Corps tradition, because that's a big part of the job is, is, you know, educating the public on those sorts of things, like those events where you're celebrating anniversaries of battles, you know, I was in Guadalcanal celebrating the 70th anniversary of that battle. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of, it depends on which band you are. So you have the Hawaii band, which did a lot of outside of the country stuff, but then the bands that are inside the country, they do, they travel around, they're doing a lot of performances for small town America, you know, um, the Steve's Ferry Shrimp Festival in <laughs> side of Lejeune or Cherry Point, you know, though. They, so you get, you so get mixed things. So is there like a tiered system in there where somebody starts out, you're doing the small town stuff, and then as you, you know, you either get tenure within the Marine Corps, no, or it's, it's, skill set ranking, you know, like chairs, I guess. Yeah. You know, that's, my extent. <laughs> that's the extent of my knowledge of music is knowing that there's the, the chairs in an orchestra, but that you would get there and go, okay, you're at a skill set that's enough to go travel the world to go do this versus, you know, you're, you're coming and playing in my backyard at a wedding. Right. Or something. Yeah, that's <laughs> interesting. An that's an interesting idea, but it, it doesn't quite work like that. It works the same way as any um, Marine Corps get, Marine gets transferred. You know, you just you go oh, really to, okay to you go to where you're supposed to go, and every band has a a little bit of a different mission. You know, based on the geography that they're at, but you rotate every three years, typically three to four years, unless you're like me, you get stuck in Hawaii for a while. But that's not a uh, sounds horrible. Sounds horrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, did uh, uh, with that did. Did, you coordinated a lot of the events, though, right? You weren't just showing up and saying, all right, I, I got to play at 7 o'clock at night. If I recall correctly in our previous conversations, you were actually in the lead on making these things happen. What was the complexity of, of that with, with making these projects, which, which, quite frankly, are little micro pro or major projects potentially yeah. could go off? Yeah, you don't start off like that, obviously. It's, it's something you work – that is something you work up to. You know, you do start off as just an individual contributor – musician showing up with your horn and, and the right uniform and playing but then as you get promoted and you and you pick up rank and you move up then you do move into more manager type roles and when i when i got when i left i was doing um i was running um anything that didn't require the whole band i was putting together the people and the and the music and the, and the logistics for that group so you have a band a bands are usually 50 size 50 members ish Okay. Um, but not every event would, can either facilitate having 50 people at it or needs 50 people at it. So you have, you know, funerals that only need one trumpet player to go to play taps. And then you have, then you might get a situation like one of my last gigs ever was, hey, we, the general's got a space on his plane for, you know, five people and we want music. Can, what music can you make with five people? And so then <laughs> you pick out, you know, you figure out what, what the requirements are and what's, you know, what kind of, what kind of events these people are going to be asked to play at. Then you put together a group that can kind of handle that. And then you work it sometimes that would be rearranging music because there's not, you know, there, there's some of that stuff that isn't written for that specific group. So you got to rearrange that. And, uh, I did a little bit of that and had, unfortunately had a lot of great friends and people that worked with me that helped me out a lot on that too and then you kind of put together a mini group and then and you go out and do this do the event do the performance and that was my um that was what i was doing when i left and a, it's special project leader or a small ensemble leader would be the nut would be the, the, like the official marine corps mos title for it small ensemble leader and there's only a handful of people that do that in the entire marine corps there's maybe 10 to 15 guys in the 200,000 plus record that, 
to get to do that. So it was a really, really special uh, privilege that I got to do that. So how do you decide wh or who, who makes a request in or who decides, hey, here's the here's the events that we're going to play? How, how does that get prioritized and you guys get deployed out to wherever you got to go? Well, just like in, in any military function, sometimes it's as simple as a guy with a lot of ranks says the band's going to go do this and then they got to do it. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> so, but you know, there are, there is structures in place and there's, there is some, um, there's a little bit of uh, there's processes involved and in what, what, what we're allowed to format, what we're not allowed to format. And there is a hierarchy inside the program. Um, you know, we have Marine musicians, Marine enlisted musicians at the Pentagon and, you know, they, you know, overseeing the program there and, and so there's a little bit of a structured hierarchy. There's a request process. You send a request form in, you can send it to the Pentagon, you can send it to the individual bands, and then it's got to get vetted by legal. And, you know, of course the band's going to vet it, you know, can we do this? Do we want to do this? And then there's a, you know, you, uh, an approval process that kind of works its way up the chain of command, just like anything else. Well, what about, you know, we talked about off the top, I mean, you played in a bunch of different countries for kings and queens and other presidents of other countries. I mean, is there a different etiquette or protocol that you guys kind of get briefed on when you're going into an environment like that versus I kind of remember, I think in middle school, the Marine Corps band coming to my middle school and playing a bunch of movie things. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, there's got to be something different. Do you have any stories around there? Absolutely, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. We were one of, I had a group in, I was a part of a group in 2011 that um, I think this is accurate, was one of the first openly invited US military presence in China in some time. So we did some performances in Shanghai and Beijing. Um, awesome. And which was a which was a cool trip, you know, to get to, to do that. And yeah, absolutely. The there's there's way there's way different protocol and things involved for guys going to China than there is guys going to the middle school down the street. <laughs> so that 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 particular thing, I believe, even all the way up to the commandant of the Marine Corps at the time, was at least aware that we were doing that and had an opinion on us being there um, in China at the time. And we were going. It was completely you know a community relations event. We played for we played for a high school like the equivalent of like a high school marching band festival we played at we, we were kind of the end of the night key performers for for that event then we played some con some other concerts for at, uh schools in the area community events there and um that was a that was a big trip we did everything in there between marching band and concert band and that's a lot of logistics of shipping instruments across the world and and because you can't you can't check you know a timpani on <laughs> On an, air, <laughs> on an airplane so that lots of lots of travel logistics and craziness um, involved in that so yeah there is a difference in um bureaucracy there sure. one of those between those two things but that's also get to... a good example of the spectrum of what you do it could be middle school music appreciation day and you're going to play you know the hokey pokey and <laughs> spongebob the theme from spongebob all the way up to you know something like pretty serious like that where we're the China trip or the New Zealand trip where there's protocol like on the New Zealand trip there's protocol involved in how you play for the Prime Minister of New Zealand and you got to learn their anthem and how they do it and and that sort of th that sort of thing so so that that I guess that begs an interesting question you know you you we think about China now I'm not gonna sit there and try to project you know right. 10 11 years ago about what you're allowed to play in an environment like that, you know, communist, you know, you know, because right now they, they yeah. censor everything that comes from the United States. What was it? Did you have to go through this crazy music selection process that you go, mm. oh, my God, we don't want to offend, you know, your, the host country <laughs> or in China, something that is absolutely like um, they may take offense to just be for whatever reason that they may have. I mean, was that something that how much did that go into your, like your planning and and then practice and prep? You know, um, we we didn't necessarily, you know, we censor the music per se. Um, we played, we did choose on that performance a lot of pretty universally known in the music world, at least selections. These like some classical music stuff, like the whole planet suite, which if even if you don't know the title of that work you recognize melodies if you if you heard it okay um that, those those sorts of things so we kind of we kind of stuck to stuck to um you know stuff that was pretty well 
well known and accepted in the in the music world per se. Um, but that's definitely something you got to consider when you go into those other countries and is what 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 music do people like and and even if it's not from an offense standpoint, you don't want to play that anything that anybody doesn't want to hear. So when we would when we would go into countries, we would look and try to figure out again what's popular here right now, um, and how can we make sure that we're you know we want to play stuff that people know when we go. Well, how, yeah, I, I guess this and, and this is me just thinking out. You know, when I, when I've went to like musicals in New York or you see a band in concert or something like that, for the most part, they're playing the same sets over and over and over again. They're very well rehearsed in that. And it sounds like to me that you have to be, I'm not, I'm not saying that others can't do that, that those guys can't do this, but you've got to be skilled to sit there and go, all right, we've only got maybe a short window to learn a whole bunch of new stuff because of this environment. Yep. So is that, is is that like an increased skill set on on your guys part because that's what you're doing or is it from musicals perspective going we learned this enough to get through this event type, type yeah. of situation and then you go all right we're never gonna do that one again well there's and i'm biased obviously but i do think it takes kind of a special skill set to do kind of the what the marine corps music program asks you to do but um there there is a lot of that so there's both or you know all kind of all three of what you've said there is music you have to know all the time and be ready to do again and again over and over with. You know, from a ceremony standpoint, the Marine Corps hasn't changed the music they use in a ceremony in a hundred, you know, hundreds of years. So you're using, you're playing the same music for those ceremonies every time you do it. So you memorize those songs and you just have them ready to go whenever, whenever you need to do it. And then there are, then there are, um, then there's like what we talked about, you're traveling to a different country and, you know, when, uh, when, I don't know if you remember that tune, uh, Gangnam Style. Yes. <laughs> but there was a time in, in Asia, and even in Samoa, we were, we were doing some some things in American Samoa. That song was crazy popular. So I think you just gave me my YouTube thumb title for <laughs> <Yeah>. this episode. <laughs> so we, uh, you know, we learned that we learned that song, and then but you got you recognize at the time, hey, this is a one hit wonder. It's going to be popular for three or four months so we're going to learn it so we can play it now so it's popular but then it's, then you know it'll go away and we won't play it anymore and then there's then there's stuff you know specifically when you're learning it that you're only playing it for this one performance and you're never gonna you're never gonna play it again that's that's some of them uh there's in tonga i did a uh gig for the coronation of the king of tonga and for his birthday uh there's a big festival cool. the king of tonga and there was some songs there that they marched to and that they used for their ceremonies that we learned that we knew we were only playing for you know for that gig we're not going to go home and play those all the time <laughs> how much time do you get to learn i mean how much lead time do you get to go we got to we get to learn this it depends most of the time you know especially with stuff like international travel that i mean it's it, it can happen on a, on a whim it has but for most of the most of that you know you get you get a pretty good amount of leeway a couple months you know that you're going on this thing and we're going to perform these these songs and that sort of thing so you get a little bit of time see and that's where my ignorance comes into of of music and being able to read music going can anybody just put a a sheet of music down and you can just pick up your trombone and just go with it or is there all that practice with everyone else to get the timing down right so it sounds coherent at I mean, least there's, of what there's, a lot, there's, there's a little bit of both most of my performance, you know, there were, it would be rare that we pulled out something that we had never seen before to play right then and there on the spot. That would not, that doesn't happen very often. Um, but, you know, you, you, if you have that ability, I mean, working on that ability really makes you prepared to, you know, do what, you know, to play well and to sound good if you can do that. But that would be a rare that we were, that we were sight reading something on the spot and then to perform it for, um, it can't happen. But it could happen. It but could, it could happen. It could, it could happen. Interesting. Be, it, Does everybody sweat? I'm sure everybody sweat bullets a little bit on something like that. I <laughs> I Maybe. Not, I don't know. I mean. It wouldn't be my favorite thing. thing. But, you know, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes stuff happens. What was probably the best event that you call back and go, that was either cool or we nailed it, you know, that from from your time? Yeah. Um, I often, in, and I and I tell this story a lot when I mean, I've, had, I've told it a lot in job interviews recently when they talk about like a moment you're proud of or something like that. And we mm -hmm. did on a smaller group trip, it was uh, maybe only about 10 people. 
uh, in a group that we called, we called it a couple of different things over the years. At one point in time, it was called Party Band, and then we changed it to call it Brass Band. But it's a, a smaller group that um, plays mostly popular music, commercial stuff, jazz, not as, not as uh, formal or the ceremonial type group, which I enjoyed and, and was my favorite group to play in. But we once did a, we were doing some work for the Cambodia, for the U American Embassy in Cambodia. And they had this, um, they had an orphanage there that was for blind and deaf kids that uh, they asked us to play at. And we were a little hesitant because it's music. So there's going to be, right. it's music and it's visual music. This, this was a group like kind of think of like a James Brown band or Earth, Wind & Fire, Tower of Power, where like there's choreography and you're moving around. Oh, okay. Like Dude, you, I didn't even think, all right. <laughs> you're, not there, you're not just standing there. You're, there's, there, it's a, in a very interactive and visual element to it as well. So we were kind of like, well, half the people are, half the kids aren't going to be able to hear us and half the kids aren't going to be able to see us. So. We were a little hesitant about it, but <laughs> <Can imagine. laughs> it was hands down the best performance I was, I was ever a part of the kids, the staff, everybody was a, just so you could tell they don't get a lot of people that show up at, to this place to help them out and do these types of things. We were, we were, I'm positive. Some of the only Americans that those kids were ever going to see. Um, and you know, being able to leave them with a positive impression of the country and of music and expose them to some things that they wouldn't be exposed to, you know, that was awesome. You know, there were some cool gigs, like I said, prime minister of New Zealand, I've, I've played for Biden a couple times. Um, th those, those types of things. That's cool that you can say that you did that, but really that gig, I walked away from that knowing that like I made an impact on those. That's awesome. In, in those moments, you know, I had a kid hold my trombone and I could see was, he was, he was blind and he was running his hands down it and like, I could see him forming the image of what it might look like. That's awesome. In his head. And so mm -hmm. that was a really, really special, awesome thing. No, that, uh, that's, that's an awesome story. How about, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the flip side of it. Okay. Did you ever have that event where you're like, oh my God, we survived this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, there's definitely, um, it's a joke sometimes where we, you know, we're getting ready to go on and the guy leading the group might come out and say, guys, there are literally tens of people out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, every, not every gig you show up to is going to have, you know, going to have a huge audience. You know, we did a, I did a gig on the 4th of July one time with, this was with my, this has become kind of a special gig because it's one of the last times I performed with my friend from last summer um, that I know you know about, we don't need to get into, but he that you know that was in virginia beach on the beach fourth of july at night fireworks thousands of people out there that was a, that was another really special really cool gig um so but not every gig's like that there are gigs that are tens of people and there are you know i and so there's so i think there's two elements when you think about things you just survive so it's gigs that are just like not super well attended and maybe you worked a lot to work up to that point but it doesn't doesn't really go off the way you wanted it to but the other part is uh we talked about that gig in tonga there was a a ceremony before in the daytime before the nighttime concert performance thing and you know it's hot it's like you're on the equator it's like real feel of like 1 115 120 and you're in uniform standing at attention and, and it's long and so there's those are some of the things that i think about just surviving when you're just standing there for a couple hours you know you play some stuff in between some speeches and and you know you, <laughs> you know. so it, it, there's there's some of those that you know you miss a lot of things but you don't miss everything <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things uh you know you you had that medical condition that got diagnosed that kind of un you know unceremoniously prompted a early retirement is that if you had been in, I'll call it the, the other, the Marine Corps band, would that have affected your performance mm. versus being in, in, uh, uh, yeah, I, the, in the enlisted program? I don't know. Um, every Marine Corps has to be, every Marine in the fleet has to be in the regular Marine Corps has to be deployable all the time. So if you're not deployable, then that's when you get into situations where you're asked, you know, to leave or medically retired, those sorts of things. So that's, that was my situation. The pacemaker made me 
non-deployable um, doctors put on some paperwork, you know, it's not recommended he be deployed to, you know, austere locations or whatever. So that may be non-deployable and, you know, prompted the exit. I don't honestly know if that would have been the case had it been um, in that. I was just curious, you know, you got, you got someone who's been in as long as you were. I, I mean, I may have mentioned this to you when, again, one of the first times you, you, me and you had talked about that going, there had to have been something, you know, to uh, an exception, you know, to right. the, to the deployable rule because there's so many jobs that need to be done and you already showed competency in the, in the deployment, the gathering of all that stuff, yeah, you know, and being an advocate because that's something we didn't talk about. I mean, quite frankly, what is, why does the Marine have all of these bands out there when you think of them as a combat fighting force around the world? Is this just strictly to promote the Marines is, or do they have something else in their mission statement that they're trying to advance? Well, every band has a secondary combat related mission statement to it. So you okay. know, the Quantico band close to us here, they're at the time I was in there, their secondary mission statement was to be a security augmentation force. So sort of kind of just the backup uh, military police unit. So when things, you know, things happened, you could, you could send the full-time MPs to, you know, take care of what, you know, an emergency or a crisis, and then you can have some, some reinforcements from the band come in to help out, supplement some things. So every, every band is supposed to, has that, like kind of secondary combat thing. But where the band really, I think, this is this is just me and talking from my experience, um, where the band really has a lot of value is international travel and relations, relationship building. You know, we I did some gigs in Vietnam that ended with me like, um, you know, spending time, you know, with uh, Vietnamese army officials and, and, you know, drinking a beer with them and stuff like that. So that's, it's hard to put value. It's hard to put like a, um, a quantifiable metric to that, but that's really where there's a lot of value okay. in, in the, in the Marine Corps music program is just having, um, so there's a different impression. Let's say we're doing a gig in the Philippines or we're doing a gig somewhere around Asia, around, around China, you know, there's a different impression of seeing a guy show up with a gun versus a guy show up with a trombone. You know, there's some, there's some civilian equity in places that we want to be our allies that have, that can be built up with, you know, through music and through real musicians being out there. And it's not just the Marine Corps, you know, the Marine Corps has got 10, um, fleet Marine pro music pro bands. Uh, but the army, every service has them. army, Navy, air force and coast guard. They all have. They all have bands in some sort of fashion. In fact, the army doing it with a similar mission. Yeah, yeah. An army relationship, has, and the army may have like a hundred. I'm not sure how big they are now, but somebody, wow, somebody could look that up. But there are a lot of the the the. It's a kind of a, kind of a little known secret. The, the military employs a ton of musicians. <laughs> I was going to say because. When I think of military bands, the first one has always been the Marine Corps band. This yep. seems to me to be the one that's out front. If you told me the Coast Guard had one, that was news to me. Yeah. Just, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I didn't know that. What about other countries? I mean, did you guys go out if when you were traveling the world, do other do other countries have similar bands? Did you ever do Battle of the Bands type yeah. of situation? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, there's um, um that Tonga gig I was talking about, that was um an international event where multiple countries bands were a part of that. And just down the road here in Virginia Beach, Norfolk area, there's a huge, it's called a Virginia International Two or Virginia International Tattoo, which is a huge military music festival. So there's, there's a Republic of Korea musicians, rock Marines that come and perform at that. There's a whole section of the British Royal Marines music that comes and performs at that. It's, there are all over the world. You know, I met in Tonga, I performed with the Australian um, musician army bands um, and in New Zealand, same thing with the New Zealand that's, horse bands. That's awesome. Very cool. Yeah, I didn't know how much that was prevalent in other places uh, as far as, you know, you guys being, you know, again, not necessarily not, you know, that non-combat role to try to build other stronger bonds with other people, like I said, having that beer, being able to go 
intertwine the bands together, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. No, that's, that's awesome. Now post, because I know yours was again, an unexpected um, retirement from the medical conditions. What is, you know, if you had had that additional, that traditional retirement period where you're going, Hey, I know I'm getting out in a, a year from now. What is there a typical post-military career for the musicians that you, you have seen others go into assuming they have that ramp up time and that type of thing that kind of sets them up for a secondary career. So I think that's definitely one of the bigger challenges is that there really isn't, um, that what we do inside their day to day, just doesn't exist in the civilian world. There's not large <laughs> civilian organizations that are going to play you, pay you, you know, a, a decent salary plus benefits and only have, and have you almost work not nine to five, the schedules differently, but you know, have you, you sure. to employee, you know, Musicians are gig based, you know, more often than not in the civilian world. And it's rare to get a job like that. Um, so there's not, especially if you want to just play, there's not jobs you walk into just as a performer. Um, there's, there's, I think there's skills that transfer, you know, to different types of roles, manager type roles. I see a lot of my guys doing project management, that sort of thing. And there's also a lot of them that kind of move into cyber, move into tech. There's some skills there. But it, the other it, reason I ask that it, it, it's because you know you see that I, I will say particularly with the pilots, you know, you, there's a lot of the the guys that retire there are pilots of some sort that do transition to an airline career or something right. along that line because you have been trained in the, one of the most rigorous environments on the face of the earth. You right. can go handle a commercial job, <laughs> you know, in that <laughs> realm. That that I would I didn't know when it comes to you know, movies, TVs, and all these places, you know, everything, even advanced YouTubers now use, you have music background, you know, that there's going to be a burgeoning field for somebody that's military trained, right. had all the time put in, you know. You know, and it's taken some time to figure out how to communicate that for me into, into, into different, you know, transfer, transferable skills. Definitely uh, something that, you know, I hope, you know, we talk about my master's degree. One of the things I'm hoping to do with that is to kind of help other Marines eventually volunteer other Marines and uh -huh. help them figure out how to talk to, you know, how their skills transfer and how they can, you know, talk about, you know, um, bringing value in a different organization after being used to doing things the same way for a long time, especially Marines that have been in there for a while. No, I was going to say that I'm seeing that as something that's kind of in the job market as a whole. Um, where you, you've got people that, that are, are writing these position descriptions that are extremely, extremely stovepiped. We want a project manager that can sit there and organize, identify risk, blah, 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 blah. But if you don't know this exact piece of software that you've been doing it this way for you know 10 years, then you don't fit the criteria. And it's like, hold on a second. If I can do 90% of the job, you're telling me that I can't figure out your stupid little piece of software very quickly. And I, and I see that being as a whole. So right. being able to help break through that, that's, that's going to be something going forward, particularly now with kind of the, uh, this employment renaissance period we appear to yeah. be in right now. <laughs> sure. For sure. So I, I'll wrap up. I'll wrap up with this. Do you still play? <laughs> <laughs> Not as often as I'd like to, but I have it. I sit out, have it sit out here so that I can. <laughs> Was almost the reason. <laughs> hey, I recognized it. <laughs> no, I didn't know with uh, you know transitioning into your you you know your new account manager role. What time recording this? You're getting ready to start working for Accenture here in the next uh, week and a half or so. Yeah. Um, you know how often you actually uh, you know break it out and uh, play. I know you did with your uh, father's uh, retirement yeah. Yeah, ceremony uh, last year, which was very cool. It's cool. One of the one of the cool things about it, although I don't play as often as I would like to is it is it kind of switches back to being a hobby and being something you do as a stress reliever or as a you know as opposed to when it was like my you know a requirement for the gig or whatever so i tried to play as much as i can but it doesn't it doesn't happen as near as often as it used to <laughs> do you encourage your kids to get in to have you encourage your kids to get into music then because it's in your lineage yeah and i think it's just i think it's something that you can do forever. You know, I, I encourage them to play sports and music and all that stuff or, or to do, to be active in all that extracurricular way. But music's one of the things you can really do for a long time. Eventually your body's going to wear out and you're not going to be as athletic. 
but you could play music for a long time. Preaching to the choir there. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Well, if anybody wants to reach out, if they got curious, you know, you get anybody that's interested in uh, joining the military band, I think this is uh, a, a definitely a, a unique career opportunity for anybody that, uh, yeah, absolutely. that plays. What's the best way for anybody to connect with you if they want would like to? Uh, email or sell is fine. You got both of those. So I'm yep. with and I'll, uh, and I'll put uh, I'll put your LinkedIn account yep. info in the show notes as well. Um, cool. And uh, man, appreciate the time. Absolutely, John. Thanks a lot, man. Cool. See you later. Hold tight for a second.